and we're live. Okay, uh, so I put up this warning slide, so I just want to, before you get too comfortable, <laughs> um, I'm going to, to basically go through assembly for at least 45 minutes of this presentation, okay? I will not be offended if you get up and leave now. Uh, but I will be offended if after 40, like 45 minutes of assembly, you decide that what the hell was I just a part of and give me a red card. So, so this is a deal here. You can give me a red card for a lot of things, but you can't be because I exposed you to assembly for 45 minutes. Okay? We're good? All right. So yeah? if you haven't worked with assembly, then you have no hope of understanding? Hopefully, you will understand. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see, you tell me. Okay. okay. Um, so the question was, will I understand? Well, well that, that, that's the experiment. This is the first time I do the talk, so we'll, hmm, we'll, ha we'll, we'll see. All right. So uh, the talk is called uh, Return Oriented Programming and Introduction. Uh, but to give you an introduction to return oriented programming, we have to do a lot of assembly. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on my bio. I'm a C++ programmer, I've worked places, I have a master's in computer science, and my pronouns are she, there, she, they. Okay, so what we're going to do today is what I affectionately call semi-artisanal ROP, uh, which means that we're going to use some tools to generate some, some stuff, and then we're good, just going to stitch it together ourselves, and, and, and it's basically to give you a feel for the workflow. Okay, so uh, our... A vulnerable uh, application is a tiny application uh, that uh, Ulva Madal, who's right here, <laughs> uh, wrote the, uh, the, the original version of. It has only three functions. We don't really care much about this uh, application. It has a main function that calls authenticate and launch, which is in the middle here. Authenticate and launch here is going to call, possibly launch missiles on top there, based on whether or not you give it the right password. And this is loosely <laughs> inspired by the movie War Games, which you might have seen if you are old. And, <laughs> and if, if you are young, you should see it, and it's retro cool. Um, anyway, so this is the application. We won't care too much about it, but I'll give you like the idea of it is that it will print a prompt saying that you should tell it like the secret. Uh, you, if you tell it a wrong secret, so for example, David, it will say access denied and then operation complete and it will exit. And if you tell it the right secret, which is Joshua, which makes sense if you saw the movie that you probably didn't see, and then <laughs> it will say launching missiles and then operation complete. So that is the basic functionality of this. And this is how the, the, the programmer, when they wrote the, the, the program, this is how they intended it to work. Um, unfortunately, it has a vulnerability. Um, so we have a stack allocated buffer right here. And so when we uh, read in uh, whatever the user said, we are using C in, and C in will happily write over the end of the buffer and go on as long as you like. Um, so we have a stack uh, buffer overflow potentially here. Now, for, to, to make this fit on the slide, imagine that the buffer is, is small. Um, and so this is what the programmer intended and, uh, and uh, what if we write a global thermal nuclear war? Yet again, something that would make sense if you saw the movie. Um, and then we end up in something that, uh, that, um, that has been described as a, as a weird state. And this is a whole theory, and I'm not going to go into it, but if you want to, to, to look into that, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model for, for thinking about exploitation. And it's called uh, the weird machine. But anyway, so the weird state here is basically we're going to crash, right? Uh, because we did a buffer overflow and it's probably corrupted things on the stack, good chance we're going to crash at this point. Uh, okay. I'm not going to explain anything more about that application. We, we don't actually care about that application from this point on. Um, uh, we will care about the binary itself. Okay, so in this presentation we're going to do 32-bit, uh, mostly because it's smaller, <laughs> fits better on a slide, uh, and things like that. Uh, also, because, uh, because the pointers are smaller, we, we don't have a lot of null bytes in our exploit, and it helps because we're reading a string. Doesn't really matter. It's, it would be similar in 64-bit uh, for another application. Okay, so Intel 32-bit 
And we're going to go through uh, how we would design the, the shell code, which is the, the exploit that we want to run. And then we will go from that to doing the same thing in ROP. OK, so again, a warning. This whole thing is about exploitation. If that's not your <laughs> jam, the door is there. Go run, <laughs> run. OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> OK, so shell code. Uh, shell code is a piece of code, typically a machine code. So think this, these are bytes, right? Just regular bytes. Uh, and that are delivered and executed as a part of an exploit. So we are going to, to try to run code, malicious code in some way. Um, the reason why it's called shell code is the traditional, uh, <laughs> traditional use <laughs> was uh, to start a shell. So this was, uh, this was, I think the term was coined in the 90s. Uh, and, uh, and, so it, and it was based on uh, Linux, Unix-like systems, right? So the idea was to start like something like slash bin slash sh, which is what we will do today. Um, in real exploits, it will generally do something more advanced, uh, like downloading something from the internet or connecting to a server to be ready to execute a command or something, you know, m more. But um, for this example, we will just start slash bin slash sh, which is probably dash. It's a symlink to dash. Um, so uh, very, very <laughs> light introduction uh, to, to, to Linux and programs. Uh, so in, in Linux, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, it is useful to think that we have a process. And inside of that process, there is a program. So these two things, think of them as separate things. So we have a process. It has virtual address space. It has stuff in it. And a part of the things uh, that are in this address space is the program that we are currently running. In this case, our vulnerable program, our uh, war games program. Uh, if at some point uh, we manage to execute uh, our shellcode, our shellcode has, uh, it, its only goal is to try to run exec.ve, which is a system call on, on Linux, and, and, and here we want to start slash bin slash sh. If we execute, if we manage to do that inside of the vulnerable program, the whole functionality of exec.ve is to blow away our vulnerable program and replace it with slash bin slash sh. But note, it is the same process, OK? That's the whole goal. So our process, our program, will turn into a shell that has a prompt where you can write ls. OK. Yes. All right, so the plan, so this, the, the, this is the plan for the entire presentation. We will start by writing the C code for the shell code that we want to do. Uh, then we're going to test it to make sure it actually does <laughs> what we intended it to do. Uh, I recommend you do this at any stage throughout this process because it's very easy to break some. Um, then we are going to, to, now that we know what we want to do, we're going to write inline assembly uh, that does what we want it to do. And that's, again, we want to test that to make sure it still does what we wanted it to do. Uh, then we will go from that stage to creating a wrap chain, and I'll show you what I, I'll tell you what a Rob chain is at that point that does the same thing as we have done already and then we're going to test that that still does what we want it to do that is the entire plan of the entire hour all right okay so we start with writing the C code um, so so all code in this presentation is bad code um, so the C code that we want is going to look like this. And I've split it into multiple lines and, and, uh, and variables for, for clarity as we go. So the first part here is we're going to want to close the file descriptor. So this is uh, file descriptor 0. Exactly why we have to do this, I don't have time to explain. Um, <laughs> but, but I understand it now because, <laughs> because Michael explained it to me yesterday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so and, and, and so the second part here is we're going to call another system call called open. Uh, both of these we're doing uh, to make sure that, that uh, we are now uh, reading a standard in from the terminal. But it doesn't really matter. The point is we have two system calls. And then we have our exec VE. So we, we have three calls we need to make, right? OK. 
so uh, we will test it by uh, compiling it. And even to compile it without warning, we actually have to pass a flag to turn off some warning. And that's how bad it is, right? Um, but that's fine. We don't care. We're going to run it. And it gives us a shell prompt. So here we could have written like ls or something, right? Uh, so this is the whole goal of this program. The program that we compiled was the one that you saw, which had the code with the close, open, and exactly e. But when you run it, it gives us a shell. Yeah? All right. So we now know what we want to do. Um, but how are we going to do this in assembly? So on uh, x86, 32-bit, um, the, the calling convention for, for syscalls uh, is like this. So basically, a calling convention in this case is what does the kernel, where does the kernel expect to find the arguments to the syscall, and how does it know what syscall you want to do? OK, so that means we're going to be dealing with registers. Uh, so the first register we're going to care about is EAX. Uh, this is, Intel is a wonderful platform because it is backwards compatible, which uh, basically means it's kind of super mega complicated. Uh, <laughs> um, so EAX is, is a register. Uh, it is a 32-bit register, uh, but once upon a time, Intel was a 16-bit uh, platform, so it also has a part of it that you can use the 16-bit uh, names for, and then you can even use 8-bit uh, names for, for the first byte and then the second byte, so AL and AH. Uh, we're not going to worry too much about that. I just want you to, to know that it is the same register. We can just have different names for parts of it. EBX has the same system, and ECX and EDX. So the syscall number is where we're going to put it to say to the kernel, we want to do this syscall. Uh, our first argument, we have to pass an EBX, the second in, in ECX, and then the third in EDX. OK, so this is the plan. This is what we're going to spend all our time on. <laughs> OK? All right. So this was the C code for our shell code. Let's look at the first two lines. OK, so close. We want to do this. We want to, to, uh, to close file descriptor 0. All right, so, so looking at the calling convention for close, it says that uh, the syscall number for that is, is uh, hex 06, uh, uh, and, um, which is 6, because you know, even in hexadecimal. <laughs> um, uh, but, and the, the only argument that it needs is passed in EBX, and that's an unsigned int. And in our case, zero, which makes this relatively easy. Uh, the other two uh, registers are not in use for a close. OK, so we have our variable here, and we want to pass it, and it's zero. So. The, the assembly for this is, is uh, relatively short. I, I try to limit the number of assembly instructions that I have. So the first two lines, uh, we start on the line one, uh, where we are doing an XOR. And this is a way to set a register to zero. <coughs> so after we've done the XOR of EAX, it will be zero. On line two, uh, we are um, moving uh, the number, let's see if I can do this, number six into EAX. So that means that after we've executed these two instructions, EAX will have uh, the value 6. I'll show you more on the next slide. And then we do an XOR of EBX, because that's where we had to have the file descriptor. And now that's also 0. And then, oh, no, wait a second. And then we do the final line, line 4, where we do int 80, um, hex 80. And that's <coughs> how you uh, invoke a syscall. So when we do that, the kernel will go and pick in the EAX register, see, oh, we're doing syscall close. OK, where is the file descriptor? It's in EBX, and it will take it, and you know, and it will do the thing. All right, uh, so I will try to <laughs> step you through assembly by using uh, slides. I'm very ambitious. Um, <laughs> so we have, we're going to fill our first register. That is the EAX register. So we start by, by uh, doing XOR of EAX. So now the state of the register on the far right there is, is what it is currently, right? So we've done an XOR. It's now 0. Uh, then we move uh, uh, hex 6 into EAX, and now it is hex 6. And then we do uh, for, for the file descriptor, which is an EBX, we will XOR it, and it's 0. 
then we do int 80 and it will do the thing. All right. That was your soft introduction to assembly. <laughs> okay, it's only downhill from here. All right. Um, okay, so then we are going to do open. And, and immediately you can see that this is going to be worse uh, because we have a pointer and a string. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so we have uh, this is the code we're going to try to do. Uh, have looking at the calling convention for open. It's going to expect a syscall in EAX. Uh, then the pointer to the file name, so that means the address of where the string begins. It's going to be expecting it in EBX. And then uh, in ECX, it wants flags, which is an int, which is probably fine because we've done an int already, so we're all right. And then in EDX, it's going to look for a UMOT, which is an int, you know, in disguise. And so that's probably going to be fine too. So. What is going to be a problem for us here that we don't know how to do is, is how do we get the pointer in EBX and where is the string, <laughs> right? All right. So, a little more introduction to, <laughs> to assembly. <laughs> okay, so there is another register I haven't told you about, uh, which is the stack pointer register. Uh, into a stack pointer register is just going to say this is currently the top of the stack. Uh, whenever you do a push or a pop as a normal stack usage, this will be updated. So when you push, it will, you know, point to the new location and pop it will point to the, the new location. I am using that language because on x86, the stack is super weird and it grows towards lower addresses. And so, so, when, it, so when you push, it goes up. <laughs> <laughs> and when you uh, pop, it goes down, and it's just very confusing. So I've just eliminated that from the entire presentation, and we don't care. Okay? But the stack pointer register will hold the address of the thing that is on top of the stack. So, okay? Um, yes, so as we do it, it will get updated magically behind the scenes as the CPU is executing our, our instructions. Uh, it also, of course, why not, has uh, the same kind of uh, wonderful uh, names. So for example, on, on x64, uh, or on x86, 64-bit, it it's called uh, RSP, because uh, I don't know. Uh, I think the ESP became like extended, and then I don't know what happened with the R. Anybody know? No, we don't care. Um, OK, so this is going to be the assembly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll step to, through it like I did before. But the point is, the first two lines are going to fill in EAX. Uh, then this, all of this is going to fix the whole file name issue. And then we're just going to use XOR to zero out ECX and EDX. And then int 80 for the syscall. OK, so now the diagram got a little bit more complicated. So we're going to start with filling out EAX. Uh, so we start by XORing it so we know it's zero. It's just, you probably don't have to do this, but I just tend to do this all the time. Um, so then we move uh, five into EAX, and now we're done with EAX, because that's all it needed. We needed to put the syscall number in there, and it's in there, so we're done. So then we move over to EBX, which is where all the fun happens. Um, so the first thing is we're going to zero out EBX because we're going to be using it for uh, for uh, working in, uh, and we're going to push it. And the reason for that is <coughs> later, this is where our string is going to be. So it's going to be on the stack here, and this first zero that we just pushed is going to be our null terminator <laughs> because, you know, it's fun. All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put this magic value into EBX. Um, but this magic value isn't that magic. Uh, because what it actually is, is a part of a string, uh, the ASCII characters for that string. So, so it's backwards. So this is slash. So 2F is slash, then 74 is T, and then 74 is T, and then 79 is, is slash. Or Y, oh god. This slash, T, T, Y. That's the way. OK, I'm sorry. I'm dyslectic, so me fix mixing up letters is totally in character. Um, no, pardon. Um, okay, so, so we have slash TT2Y here, and then 
we're going to take the rest of the string and do the same same trick. So we, we put it we put part the ASCII codes for some of the letters into our register. We can only do four at a time because it's a 32-bit platform, which which uh, divided by by eight gives us four characters. On 64-bit, you can do eight characters in one register. <laughs> Um, okay, so now we have the string. It's on the stack. It's even null terminated. Um, so, and we and I told you before that when you push and you pop, the the stack pointer is updated, which means the stack pointer is right now pointing to the top of the stack, which is the beginning of our string, which is what we needed. So then we take the stack pointer, we put it into EBX, and now we have a pointer to the string in EBX. All right. The rest of it you, you know already because everybody's paying attention. And so <laughs> we just zero out these two registers. Uh, so that is ECX and EDX, and we're done. And that means we're going to do int 80 to actually invoke the syscall. All right. Whew. All right. Brings us to the last one. Now, the fun thing <laughs> when we get here is we have other trouble here, but some of the things here we know already. Uh, so we know how to do the string. We have a plan for that. Uh, now we have these uh, pointers to pointers thing, uh, but we're just going to set everything to null, so we're hoping that's fine. And then we're going to do the exec the e call, but we know that if we just look up the syscall, we can figure out the syscall number. So this is what we're going to do now. So uh, we look up the calling convention for exec v e, and it wants 0b in eax, so that's fine. Uh, then we want the pointer to the name, which is the slash bin slash sh in ebx. And then, um, so that's the first parameter to exec v. Uh, then it wants an arg v. And if we were good citizens, we would give it to it, but we're not, so we're not going to. So it's just going to get null. And then in edx, uh, we're going to do the same, so just null. So keeping it simple for ourselves here. So if we look at the assembly, um, it's also long. <laughs> Uh, first one is going to set the, uh, the, the syscall number in EAX, put the, the file name in EBX, and then uh, we're going to zero out both uh, ECX and EDX, and then we're going to do uh, invoke the syscall. So you know where this is going. It's going to be very similar to what we did before. So we're just going to put the syscall number in EAX. We're going to uh, build the string on the stack. And then we are going to put the, the in EBX, we're going to put uh, where the stack pointer is now into EBX, so that is the pointer. And for people who never understood C pointers before, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> okay, and then uh, in argv, we're just going to zero out these two, right? So we're done, and we're going to do our, our uh, syscall. So far, so good, you're halfway. Okay. <laughs> So we're going to just uh, test that to make sure it actually works, because Patricia says a lot of things. And so here is our code. We have our close, we have our open, and we have our exec.ve. So if we uh, then uh, build that and run it, it gives us a shell prompt. All right, so now we have, we have reproduced what we did in C code. Now we did it in uh, Intel syntax assembly. And now we move into um, the hard part. <laughs> All right, so the topic of this presentation was not uh, how do we write shell code, it is creating uh, a ROP or teaching ROP oriented or return oriented programming. Uh, so, return oriented programming is an exploitation technique uh, that was designed specifically uh, to, to get around the problem of the stack no longer being executable. And that means that if you wrote shell code and put it on the stack, which you know in the good old days was how you did things, uh, then we couldn't actually execute that code because it was marked as not executable. And so this became you know, a sad thing. Uh, so when your stack is not executable, what do you do? Okay, because we have our uh, we have our sh shell code. This is what we want to achieve. But if we actually take the bytes the, that represents this assembly and we put it onto the stack, we cannot execute them. So the foundational idea of uh, of ROP, or maybe kind of two ideas, 
so the first one is that the, there, there is an instruction called ret, and that is the instruction uh, that uh, is executed when you return from a function. Uh, it has a, a, a friend called, uh, called call, and, and, and when you call, uh, when, you, when you invoke call, the call instruction, uh, it will put the address of the next instruction on, on the stack. And when you do ret, it will pop that address off the stack and put it in the instruction pointer. Yet another thing I haven't told you about, but I'll tell you about. So, so the idea here is that a ret will cause you to jump back to where you were called from and continue executing where you were called from after the function is done. Hopefully, after we've done this like 50 times, it, this will make sense. Um, so just as a visual, we are looking at a ret instruction being executed. So ret, it's right there <laughs> on the bottom. It just says ret if you can't see it, it doesn't matter. Um, OK, so imagine this is our very small stack. It has just two addresses on it. That's all that's there. Um, the stack pointer is pointing at the top of the stack. And so a ret is being executed. And so what happens? That means that whatever is on top of the stack is going to be copied into the instruction pointer. And we did a pop, so that means the stack pointer has to go down. So this is the state. But when, we, when the instructions are con continuously running, right? so when we put a different address in the instruction pointer, it has to go there and start executing code. Uh, and this address is somewhere in executable memory. So somewhere there's an address, and the instruction pointer will jump there and start executing stuff. In this case, stuff is XOR EAX. Uh, so we're going to start by doing that. So the first part here is XOR EAX, and we know that that's going to set EAX to 0. So far, so good. Then it's followed by a ret, which means we would go back to the stack, take address 2, and so on. But we're not going to do that, because now I'm going to take it and make it worse. <laughs> so imagine that we did this a lot, right? So this is, we have done a stack buffer overflow. And so imagine that you know, the, the, the right-hand side here is the stack. So, uh, so here you have uh, the stack allocated buffer. Uh, and then we have the return address. So the stack allocated buffer is in a function. right? Somebody, it's, it has a function, and in there, there's a stack allocated buffer. When we, oh no, I'm losing my, my mic. There we go. All right, and uh, once we have an overflow, it's going to continue overflowing down the stack. Uh, and one of the things it's going to overwrite is this return address on the stack, which was the, the intention was that we were going to return from to where we were called, and but we are malicious, and so we don't care. What we do know is at some point in, in this vulnerable application, there is a ret, and it will go and grab whatever we put in this location. And it's going to put it into the instruction pointer and jump there. All right, so under here we have what I call the rest of the ROB chain. We will get to it. The point is that we don't really care about the overflow in the beginning. We care about the first, first one here. So we're going to put an address on the return address, and that is the address of the first what is called a ROP gadget. Now, the structure of a ROP gadget is basically that you have one or a few instructions, and then it's followed by a ret. All of the gadgets will have this structure. So right after we have gadget number two. So if we think about what we did before, when this address, the gadget number one address, is copied into the, the instruction pointer, execution will jump over here. It will execute these instructions. And then when it's done, it's going to do a ret, which will, means that it will go down here, pop this one into the instruction pointer. Now it will go over here, do these instructions. Oh, it's followed by ret. Oh, surprise. Now, oh, there's another one. OK, so we'll go over here and do that, and so on and so forth. And that's how they're chained together. So by just here on the stack, all we have are addresses. 
right? Just a bunch of addresses. Oh, pointing is really hard. Um, okay, so we just have a bunch of addresses here. The instructions are actually somewhere else in memory. And the reason for that is we are in, we are in a process and it has a program, probably has a bunch of libraries too, and all of these, the program code and the library code and all of that has to be in memory, and that the, the pages that they're on has to be executable. So instead of actually putting code in here, we are just using the code that is already in memory. And so we can jump around in memory from place to place, all we have to know is where they are, and as long as it has the structure of instructions followed by ret, we can just chain them together in our exploit, and that gives us this. And this is called a ROP chain. It's a chain of, of addresses to gadgets in memory. All right? I'm surprised nobody's run away yet. OK. <laughs> so to, to put all of this together, we, we have to put it into an exploit. And so in the beginning, we're going to have this padding, because we don't care. Uh, and the first, and so this is our wrap chain, and the first gadget is going to hit the return address on the stack. And then after that, this whole mechanism will just drive itself because you jump to that gadget, it has a ret, it will go to the next gadget. It has a ret, it will go to the next gadget, and so on. Okay, is this all right? Yes, okay, awesome. All right, um, so you can script this uh, to make this string. Uh, so, so you will have something like this, uh, so this is a, our padding, then we have our wrap chain in the middle, and then we just print out the string. And you can print it and write it to a file or something. All right. Hi. Okay, but the cool thing is, how do you find all of these gadgets, right? We have a binary, but how do we know where, in, where these things are? And the thing is, this is actually something that, that lends itself to automation. <laughs> So there are lots and lots of tools to try to find gadgets in binaries. And we're, I'm just going to show you one, which is called Dropper, but there are many more. And people also, many people also make them themselves for fun. Uh, so the, so if, you, uh, if you run Dropper on our binary, so our binary is called Target because it's a great name, uh, and then we can even say, I want a, I want a ROP chain that does an exec VE. And I can even say that these are bad bytes. I don't want these bytes to occur because you know, here we have a 0, 0, and that's going to be a null terminator for a string. That's not going to be good. Uh, and then 0, 9, I think, is a space, and 0, B might be a tab. Or, no, 20 is a space. But yeah, but there are different kinds of characters that will do badly in our exploit. So we say, OK, we don't want those. Uh, so can you create a full ROP chain? It's a tab. There we go. <laughs> Someone who is making a, a code editor would know that. Yes, or an editor. Um, yes, so basically these are the things that we don't want. Uh, and when we run that on our file, it loads gadgets because I've run it already. And it will say, OK, I, I can make a wrap chain for the syscall execve. And it's processing. And it got all of the gadgets it needs. And at the bottom, it says syscall gadget found. And what it ends up making is something that I'll just cut off some of it in the middle here. So it's, it's a Python script, right? Like I showed you earlier. It includes a, a little bit that I'm not going to go through too much here. It's basically so that uh, it, the addresses, you can rebase them to different kinds of base addresses uh, if you if but it doesn't really matter, so we we'll don't, don't care about it. Uh, the basic idea is what we want to look at is the ROP chain inside, right? So this <coughs> pink section here in the middle. All right, so this is what it looks like. Um, it looks kind of intimidating, uh, but we will go through it many times. Um, so the basic idea here is that we have these addresses, and these are the addresses of the gadgets. So this is the first address. If I go back and forward, you can see it occurs, occurs three times. So we have it's here, and here, and then down there at the bottom. And it has helpfully <laughs> given us what the instructions is next to it. So this is a pop EAX ret. Pop EAX will then take whatever's on top of the stack and put it into EAX, and then the ret will. Well, it will do what ret does. 
And so here we have uh, the, the second gadget, and it does lots of different pops. And then the third one, it's going to actually uh, write something to memory. We'll get to it. And then it's an XOR of EAX, uh, a pop into EBX, ECX, and then a bunch of more pops and an XOR. And down here, we have a negation of EAX. I'll get to that. And the final one is that it might be hard to see in the back is just int 80 ret, where you don't really, you know, yeah. So, so that's going to invoke the syscall. So these are the nine gadgets, uh, or we can put them up here. These are the nine uh, snippets of code that it found, and it uses some of them several times uh, to, to, ex to, to chain together the, what it wants to do. And remember, what we want to do is we want to fill these four registers with what we need, right? EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. And, and that's all we need to do before we do the int 80, which is going to execute the system call. And these are the instructions that it uses in the generated uh, uh, payload. So, ready? OK. So this is the stack. This is where we're going to have our wrap chain. Uh, these are uh, the registers that are going to be in use. Uh, this is uh, where we're going to have the three first, uh, um, uh, the three, three first gadgets at the bottom. Um, uh, this is a uh, memory where we're going to be writing to. And up here is the instruction pointer. All right. This is the beginning of our wrap chain. All right. So our stack pointer is here. And for this section, I'm not going to move the stack pointer for every time we do a pop. We're just going to move it for every gadget, because if not, it's going to be very messy. Uh, so just imagine it moves kind of down as we go. All right. So the first thing is, this is going to go into our instruction pointer, because a ret ha is being executed. Uh, so that goes into the instruction pointer. The instruction will jump down here, and it will execute a pop EAX. Now, because it's doing a pop EAX, and you have imagined, because you're a helpful audience, that this stack pointer is moved down here, it will pop this value that's here on the stack Let's do it like this. That is here on the stack, which is this string. I have helpfully translated the ASCII for you. <laughs> OK, excellent. And so we will then move that value into EAX. All right, next one. Uh, this uh, gadget, well, the address of the gadget will be put into the instruction pointer. The instruction pointer will jump down here. And this one actually has a lot of things we don't care about. We actually only care about uh, the pop EDX, but it does pop EDX, EBX, ESI, EDI, EBP, lots of stuff we don't care about. Uh, so what we're going to do, it does the pop EDX and first. And so we have helpfully provided here uh, the value that we want uh, to put into EDX. And so we're going to pop. So EDX is the first pop, then pop EBX. And we're just going to put trash there. ECI, trash, EDI, trash, EBP, trash. We don't care. We got the EDX. And the important thing to notice here is that we have a gadget that does more than we want, but we can just kind of provide trash for those. Um, Exactly what trash means ha tends to, to, uh, to uh, differ from different types of tools. In, in Ropper, it's dead beef. Uh, but in lots of them, they're just A's or something. OK. The stack pointer is down here. And that will then, because we have a ret, remember, this is, I'm just going to remind you, down here in the corner, there is a ret. And so when this ret happens, it will go and pick up the next address. Uh, put it in the instruction pointer. And this, I'm not going to go through too much in detail here, but, the, but the, the, this instruction is going to take uh, the pointer that is in EDX, which is this pointer here. And if you see, it's 1CA060, which is the same as, as this thing over here. Um, and it's going to put there the value that is in EAX, which is this little string. Right? So this is what it does. It writes what is an EAX here. 
All right, so we'll leave that because we want that and we do the rest of our rock chain. And so let's do this. How are we doing on time, just so I know? Okay, we're good. All right. Um, so we do the first uh, gadget, put, uh, put it in the instruction pointer, jump to where it is, and it's a pop EAX, so that's great, so we put that in EAX. Then we go to the next one, and it is the same one we had before. Uh, so here it's going to do a pop into EDX. Uh, this value that we helpfully provided on the stack, and that is also an address note. If we look at the address, it matches this address here. And so if you, if, uh, for, for people who are sitting and doing math in the audience, you can see that this is four bytes after this one. Um, and then we just do deadbeat for everything else. And then we move to the last gadget, which is going to, to write the value in EAX to the address in EDX. All right, so now we're here. See, this is... We still need a null pointer, people. Uh, okay, a uh, null terminator. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to do it again. Very similarly, I'll do it faster this time. Uh, so we have zero in EAX. Uh, we need the pointer to where we're going to write it in EDX. And then we are going to write there. And so we are writing zero over there. Now we have a string in memory. Thank goodness. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that brings us to, to the registers, because we still haven't done the registers. We have the string in memory, but we, don't have, uh, we haven't done the registers yet. But that's faster. So uh, the first gadget is just going to pop uh, whatever's on top of the stack into EBX, and we have the address there. Uh, the next one is going to do the uh, same thing for ECX in with the values, and then we have uh, that we need to do it for EDX, which has the very convoluted weird one, which writes dead beef everywhere. Um, no, it's a different one that also has writes dead beef. And then the, um, here we are going to pop into EAX uh, because we need the syscall number. But in this case, because we had these bad bytes and things, it does a little trick, which is kind of uh, fun if you like um, to complement math. Um, which if you don't, you don't care. So, um, <laughs> so it writes a totally different value than we want, and then it does a different instruction, which is a negation of the value that's in EAX, which will magically transform it to the value we want. So, that's fun. All right, so this is, the, this is the state. We have managed to fill in all of the registers. We have a string, it's in memory. Uh, we have the address to that string in, in EBX like we were supposed to. And so let's have in a little bit. Uh, uh, so the last instruction we're going to do is, is uh, invoking the syscall. And that's it, right? So if we look at what we needed, we needed the syscall number in EAX, and we have it. We need the string, uh, the pointer to the string in EBX, and we have it. And then we're just going to actually pass uh, pointers to null in EDX and, and ECX. Um, and then we invoke the syscall, and magic happens. Yes? Just a quick question. So I, I got lost at some point. When you invoke Roper, or Roper, you just gave it the exec DE argument, as far as I could see. But somehow... The yeah, okay, let's... let's so the question is, uh, how did the, the, the Roper bit go? So I'll, let's just have another look because I split it over several slides. There we go. So the, the actual call uh, is this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here uh, the first parameter is, is file target. So target is the name of the binary and it's in current directory. And that's the war games binary? Yes, that is the war games binary. Uh, and, and then chain execve just because it can make different types of chains, some for Windows and, and stuff, so you have to indicate which one you want. And there is, I think, some, some indication that they want to in the future be able to support many different system calls, but I don't think they actually fully support them. Uh, and then the, the, the last argument is the bad bytes, and those are the ones that we don't want. And if for people who were, were wondering about the negation, Notice that one of our bad bytes is 0b, which is the syscall number, <laughs> which is unfortunate. <laughs> so with the negation, we can still have it because it's, um, 
it's there. So Robert just assumes that you want to go to binge, that you want to start a shell. So, so uh, yes, yeah, so the traditional, so this, what I've shown you, the XXVE of slash bin slash sh is like the traditional thing. So this is like what, so, so one of the things that you will see when people do uh, exploitation, for example, on Windows, uh, on Windows, they will often start the calculator. Uh, and that's just to prove that I have, uh, I have code execution, I managed to start the calculator. It also looks better on a video. Like, you might have seen that I made like the shell prompt really big. That's to make it impressive. <laughs> but, but on Windows, they, pop, they, they, they start the calculator and they actually call it pop calc. And make it sound cool. Um, okay, so um, yeah, let's. Yeah, but it, it was a very, very. Uh, it's it's better to go back. All right, so this is where we were. We filled in all of our registers. Life is good. Okay, but for people who uh, are following along, we didn't only want to do XXV. We had other stuff we wanted to do. Yeah, so. It, will, it created a ROP chain for us that did the XXVE, but we actually wanted to do the close and the open first. And so that it doesn't, we don't have a ROP chain for that. So if we look at close, uh, we have some things that we need. We need to, to put our syscall number in EAX, and we need to put a zero in EBX. And we can use some of the existing gadgets that we found earlier. Pop EAX is going to be nice. Uh, negating of EAX is going to be nice. So we can, in this case, put the syscall number in EAX with these. And we need the syscall instruction, which is the int 80. But we are missing uh, the XOR of EBX. That was not one of the things that was created by Ropper. All right. If we look at open, we can use almost all of the gadgets because it was very similar, right? We have the string and all of those things. We just put in a different string. Uh, so most of it we can use, uh, but we are missing the zeroing out of ECX and the zeroing out of EDX. So if we look at XIV, of course, it has all of the gadgets because that's what the ro what Ropper generated. So it, has, so it can do XIV. So what we are missing is three gadgets. Uh, so XOR of EBX, XOR of ECX, and XOR of EDX. Thankfully, though, Ropper has <laughs> another API. And that is that you can search for specific instructions that you want. So here we do uh, what we want is an XOR of EBX. And when we do that, it will search for gadgets that do that, but maybe do other things as well. And so, you will end, so it will search for many different things. And some of these might be fine. You might be able to fiddle them to do what you want, but it would be nice if you get one that is exactly what you want. Uh, so down here we have at the bottom XOR EBX EBX RET, which is exactly what we want. And so all three of these are actually present in the binary when we search for them, so now we have, uh, have those addresses and we can use them in our exploitation. So. We're going to put all of those together in this long string. I'm not going to show you that. Uh, so that when it is executed, it will do the close, and it will do the open, and then it will do, uh, do the execve. And uh, in this case here, in the script, it's going to write all of this out to a file. So this is the long string, little padding, and then the whole wrap chain. And it's going to put that into a file. Then we start our, our, our target application in GDB because we want to, to see what happens. Because, you know, ha like 99% of the time when you're doing exploit development, the target crashes. Um, and that's kind of hard, like most of the job is trying to make it stop. Um, <laughs> so, so then we're going to say that we want the target to read from our ROP chain file uh, instead of standard in. And uh, so we, oh, I forgot to change the name here. It was called Advanced Dropper. <laughs> anyway, and uh, it starts uh, the application. It says access granted, because apparently we managed to do that much when we overwrote uh, the stack. Launching a negative number of missiles. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but that would be really nice. <laughs> um, 
and then it says access denied <laughs> because everything is broken at this point. And then it suddenly GDB says, oh, wait, this process is now running a different program. It's no longer running you know, the war games program. It is currently running slash user slash bin slash dash. And that's because on, on this machine, slash bin slash sh is a symlink to, to dash, which in this case is in user bin dash. And then we get a shell prompt, which is down here for people in the back. Thank you. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, I, I managed to, to show you how, how uh, return-oriented programming works. And um, because we got shell. Yay. OK, an applause for the shell. Thank you. And that is the whole talk. So now we have a good 10 minutes for questions, or nine minutes. OK, yes? I just want to confirm a piece of one thing. You talked about gadgets. Yes. And what you meant by a gadget was really just a piece of existing code in the executable that you hunted down because it was a piece of code that did something that you want. Yes. OK, so the question is, what is a gadget? Or, 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 so this is. Let's see, this is a gadget. So somewhere in the binary somewhere is a sequence of bytes that when interpreted as uh, instructions would be interpreted as XOR of EBX followed by a RET. The interesting thing about x86, uh, well, the Intel platform, is that it has variable length instructions. Uh, so that means that this instruction doesn't necessarily have to be in the binary. But the sequence of bytes we're looking for has to be somewhere on one of these executable pages, which means that this could actually be a substring of a totally different <laughs> instruction, um, which is, is one of the fun things about, about uh, the Intel platform. Yes? And the comment said that uh, the bigger the binary, the easier it is to find the gadget. Yes. So uh, you are kind of cheating by doing C++ because <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's saying, saying okay, so, so the, the, the thing, the, the question is you need to be able to find all of these uh, gadgets, and that means the more binary, the better. And uh, uh, so you have more to look at, right, to find exactly what you want and hopefully something that fits well. Um, uh, and that means you need a bigger binary, and, and we have a, you know, a very small program, and he says that I'm cheating because I'm using C++, which is going to bloat <laughs> the binary, which is rude. <laughs> but, but yes, that is an issue. Uh, yeah. So what do you do when you can't find the gadget you need? Okay, so then, okay, what do you do when you can't find the gadget you need? Uh, so in real life, binaries are quite big, so it's not an issue. Uh, most of the time, I, I, I think people have done research on it, says that they, are they can find a Turing complete set of gadgets in almost all binaries. Um, yes. Uh, so, but for me, that if you have a very small program, uh, then, then for, 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 for educational purposes, that might be an issue. And so what I do sometimes is I cheat and I, I put uh, the, the instructions that I want in, in a C file as inline assembly, and I call it a gadget farm, and then I just compile it with my <laughs> other thing, and then I find them by magic. <laughs> yes? Well, okay, would, would a statically linked program be less secure than a dynamically linked program? Um, it would be bigger uh, because when you have a statically linked program, basically you're taking all of the libraries and just <laughs> putting it into your binary. So there's more code, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, with a statically linked program, you, all of your binaries, <laughs> all of your libraries are inside of you, which gives you other types of security issues. Like, for example, what if you have a vulnerability in your open SSL library that you have now statically linked into this binary, right? Uh, if it was on the system, then somebody might uh, update it to a new version, and then you might be. So it's it all technical questions. I have one answer, and that is, it depends. <laughs> yes. Um, could you, uh, other than it depends, uh, or uh, <laughs> uh, for going after a memory exploitation or a buffer overflow, like across a, across a network where you might not have access to the binary mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. uh, 
OK, so, so if you're going to develop a ROM chain for a binary that is long, uh, running on a remote system. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, how do you do that? OK, so the, the most common way to do that is to reproduce the system. Uh, so if you can, uh, and you can do that oftentimes by, 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 by looking at the services running, they will leak enough information about uh, the, the version and things like that. So you might be, be able to, to uh, figure out the versions of the things that you need to, to attack. Then you set up a local system that is the same. Uh, and uh, and that's kind of how you would work. It ma it makes things harder, but then you basically you do your, all your development and and debugging locally, uh, and then and then you try to do it remotely, but still with the VMs, until you have nailed out all of your issues. Yeah. Any yeah. Okay, is there something you can do uh, yeah, uh, to, to mitigate against this? Yes, uh, there, there was uh, specifically uh, one, uh, uh, one thing that has been, been uh, was developed by, by uh, Microsoft. Uh, it's called Control Flow Guard. And in Control Flow Guard, you basically are recording when you compile all of the, the, the things that you are allowed to jump to. So, so remember, we have addresses. We're just jumping randomly. Uh, and Control Flow Guard, it just makes a table of all of the things that you're allowed to jump to, uh, to, so that you can't do this random jumping everywhere. Of course, then somebody had to figure out a way to, to do it anyway. And a new technique was developed, and it's called uh, block-oriented programming, where it, uses, it takes the table from C Control Flow Guard, yeah. creates a graph, tries to figure out, again, like I want to do this instruction and this instruction, and then finds a path through the graph that's, that manages to fill the registers with the things that you want. Because, you know, we're programmers, and that's how we do things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any more questions? OK, thank you. Thank you so much for coming.